Our intelligence shows the Assad regime and its forces preparing to use chemical weapons, launching rockets in the highly populated suburbs of Damascus, and acknowledging that a chemical weapons attack took place. If you have the evidence, you should present it. If it's not presented, it means they don't have it. They say they've intercepted some communications, which don't prove anything, but fundamental decisions, like the decision to use force against a sovereign nation, can't be based on such evidence. something called 
mouth. So number one, they did not kill him. Number two, they did not crucify him. Number three, Allah took. Took what? Took what? Wafat. When someone dies, we have to perform Salatul Janaza. And in the Salatul Janaza, there is a dua in which this word is located, Wafat. Allahumma man ahiyaytahu minna fahiyi al-Islam. Wa man tawafaytahu minna fatawafahu al-Iman. It is taking the soul. Taking the soul. So Allah took his soul. That's the honest answer. And then number four. Allah made it appear unto them that he was crucified. Hmm? But there was only one way that that could happen. Is it possible for Allah to take the soul and then send it back? Is that possible? Yes. They thought he was dead. <laughs> the family. So they made the arrangements for the funeral. And uh, after the body was put down in the grave, and the grave was filled up, Allah returns the soul. Is it possible? And when you wake up, the place is very dark. What happened? When I went to sleep, it wasn't dark. So you call out to your wife, but nobody answers. So you try to get up, but space is very small. You're getting worried now. What is this? And you begin to feel your clothing, but this is not the clothes in which I went to sleep. And then you realize you and your grave. That's punishment. So the question is, is it possible for Allah to take the soul? So they think you are dead. And then Allah returns the soul, so you didn't die. Yes, the answer is yes. And it is to be found in Surah Al-Zumar of the Quran. Listen to the Quran. Allah takes the souls when it is a time of mouth or death. وَالَّتِي لَمْ تَمُتْ And those who do not die while they are awake, Allah takes their souls while they are asleep. فَيُمْسِقُ الَّتِي قَضَى عَلَيْهَا الْمَوْتِ Allah then keeps those souls for whom mouth or death is written. وَيُرْسِلُ الْأُخْرَى and the rest of Allah sent them back for a prescribed period of time. So yes, the answer is yes. Allah can take his soul and people think he is dead. And Allah can then return the soul. No, he did not die. This happens in sleep. So they took his body down because they thought he was dead. Our sources don't tell us anything more, but the Christian sources say they put the body in a cave and they sealed the cave. Allah then returned the soul to the body. So he didn't die. Like the fellow who they buried, thinking he was dead. But when Allah returned the soul, no, he didn't die, but he's in his grave. And they forgot to put a cell phone when they buried him. 
Oh. He, he, he's calling out, nobody's answering. No. Allah is punishing you. Now you will die. This is punishment. And then the Quran tells us, Allah made it appear unto them that he was crucified. So this is what happened. Allah took the soul, they thought he was crucified. Allah returned the soul, he was not crucified. So he did not experience mouth or death. And then the Quran says, number five, Allah raised him. Raised him where? Not to heaven. Allah raised him to the Samawat of the parallel universes. This is where Nabi Muhammad went in the Mirage. So these are the five things that the Quran tells us about that event. Since he did not die, he did not experience mouth. And Allah says in the Quran, every soul must taste mouth except including Nabi Isa Islam. The implication is that he has to return. This is the Quran, this is the Quran, this is the Quran. He has to return and he has to experience mouth or death. The Quran says, Minha khalaqnakum from this earth, the dust, did we create you. Wa fiha nu'idukum and into it will we return you even if they cremated you, the dust will still return. Wa minha nu'idukum daratan ukhra and from this we will extract you one more time. This includes Nabi Isa alayhi salam. So one day, you will have to return. And the return of Nabi Isa alayhi salam, Jesus, is the crowning event of Akhir zaman It is the most important event in history which still remains to occur. Before he returns, Nabi Muhammad informed us that Allah created someone who is called Dajjal, Al Masih Dajjal. Dajjal who will seek to impersonate Nabi Isa, the true Messiah. So he is the great pretender. He is a deceiver, he deceives. PhD in deception. Dajjal has to get the people, the Banu Israel, to accept him as the Messiah. In order for them to accept him as the Messiah, he has to rule the world from Jerusalem, because that's what the Messiah is supposed to do, and that is what Jesus salam, will do when he comes back. Because Banu Israel were informed that Allah was going to send to them a prophet who would be known as the Messiah, and who will rule the world from the throne of Nabi Dawood alayhi salam, the state of Israel, the holy state of Israel, Jerusalem. In order for Dajjal to rule the world from Jerusalem and to then claim that he is indeed the Messiah, we have to do a number of things. And I explain them in my book entitled Jerusalem in the Quran. Many of you have read that book. Number one, he'll have to liberate the Holy Land, which is on the Muslim road. He did that already in 1917. Number two, number two, he'd have to bring the Jews back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own. Remember, they were expelled for 2,000 years. He's done that already. The Jews are back in the Holy Land. They've reclaimed it as their own. Number three, he'd have to restore his state of Israel in the Holy Land and get them to believe this is Holy Israel. He's done that already, 1948. Number four, 
And this is where we're going to dwell in this lecture a lot. He'll have to cause that Israel to rule the world. He'll have to cause Israel to rule the world. And when Israel is the ruling state of the world, then a man will stand up in Jerusalem. Nabi Muhammad Islam described him. He says he'll be a Jew. He would be a young man. He would be powerfully built. He'll have curls. The Orthodox Jews have curls. And he will declare, I am the Messiah. But he would not be the Messiah. He would not be the son of Mary. No. He would be the Jah. And after he declared that I am the Messiah, and the Israelite people accept him, the Jews accept him as the Messiah, he can rub his hands and he can say, Mission accomplished. But only then will Jesus return, Nabi Isa Islam, not before. Is there a timeline? Have we been given a timeline of events? that we would know that this moment is approaching? Yes, there is. And tonight we want to turn to only one hadith. My students are familiar with that hadith. It is in the Sunan of Abi Dawood. And listen to what the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's speaking first about Jerusalem. And then he speaks about Medina. And then he speaks about the great war that the Christians call Armageddon and we Muslims call the Malqa, which will make the First World War and the Second World War look like a fight over peanuts. So great will be this war hmm, which is coming. And then he speaks about the conquest of a city called Constantinople. Mustafa Kemal changed the name to Istanbul and then prohibited us from using the name Constantinople. If you go to Turkey and you use the name Constantinople, you could be arrested. <laughs> but since our prophet used the name Constantinople, it is a sunnah. So we say to Mustafa Kemal, go jump in the Red Sea. We're going to call it. We're going to call the city Constantinople. You can't stop it. And then he speaks about the Khuruj of Dajjal. Dajjal now appears in human form. This is the hadith. Listen to it. Obran Ubaid al Maqsis. When that sign appears, the Jerusalem has emerged out of obscurity and has come center stage in the world. Jerusalem is built up. Jerusalem is flourishing. Jerusalem is a very important capital in the world, in world affairs. When that sign comes, number one, then look for number two. Number two, Umran Ubaid al Maqdis Kharabu Yatri. Yatrib is the old name for Medina. At that time, Medina will be in a state of forlorn desolation. Over there, they're building up. Over here, they're destroying. <laughs> Medina plays absolutely no role in world affairs. The importers stay more important than Medina. And the only importance of Medina is to go to visit the grave of the Prophet of Islam. Nothing else. So there you are, two. The first one is already here. Oh yes, Jerusalem today is a very, very important city in the world. And the second one is already here. Medina is already in a state of forlorn desolation. So number three. Number three is what is now to occur. The next one to occur is number three. What is that? Umran Ubaid did not this. Karabu Yathrib. Karabu Yathrib. Urujul Malhama. The Great War will now take place. We're going to spend some time tonight in that Great War. When that Great War takes place, most of mankind will die. So that 
It's an important subject, wouldn't you say so? If we are around the corner from destruction of the whole world, surely the khutbah in the masjid should be making mention of it. Is there any masjid in the world today <laughs> in which the khutbah is directing attention to the subject? You can keep on searching. The malhama is so great a walk that birds flying in the sky will fall down and die. Why would birds fall down? It has to be radiation. And therefore that suggests nuclear warfare and the radiation which comes from nuclear warfare. It suggests universal destruction of the world. And now we turn to Surah Al-Isra of the Quran. And here is a verse of the Quran, nobody ever quotes. It is a Lord, it is not in the Quran, because nobody ever quotes it. وَإِن مِّن قَرْيَةٍ إِلَّا نَحْنُ مُغْلِكُوهَا قَبْلَ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ أَوْ مُعَذِّكُوهَا عَذَابًا شَدِيدًا كَانَ ذَلِكَ فِي الْكِتَابِ مَسْتُورًا not a single city or town will escape, says Allah. Not a single town or city will escape, says Allah. We are going to destroy them all. This is the Quran. And those which escape destruction will be punished with terrible punishment. And this is a matter inscribed in the book. And so the Malhama will witness universal destruction around the world and most of mankind will perish. How far away are we from the Malhama? Since number one has already come and number two has already come and the next one is number three. How far away are we from the Malhama? After the Malhama, you come to the conquest of Jerusalem, sorry, the Constantinople, and then the Khuruj of Dajjal. Let us go back now to Jerusalem. How did Jerusalem come out of its obscurity and be sent to stay in the world today? Who did it? Who is responsible for it? Who is responsible for defeating the Muslims and taking over the city of Jerusalem and the Holy Land and returning it to the Jews. Who is responsible for that? Who are those who control power in the world today? Who are they? Does the Quran tell us? Remember our topic is the Quran and ask it of Zaman. We go now to Surah Al-Ma'idah and you know there is a wrong way to study the Quran and there is a right way. The wrong way is to take a verse by itself in isolation. And if you do that, you can make mistakes. Like for example, Allah ordered the angels to make sijda before Adam and they all made sijda except Iblis. So Iblis has to be an angel. Hmm? <laughs> Use the wrong methodology. Since the order was given to the angels, so he has to be an angel. Wrong. When you use the right methodology to go to the whole Quran, not take a single verse, then you say, no, 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 he could not be an angel. Why? Because angels have no choice. Angels cannot disobey. When an angel is given an order, he has to obey. But he disobeys, so he cannot be an angel. So proper methodology is to go to the whole Quran. Now let us see the verse. Surah Al-Ma'idah. Allah gives a command. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, O you who have faith in Allah, la tattakhitu al-yahuda wa al-nasara awliya, do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians as your friends and allies. Is Allah speaking about all Jews and all Christians? If we use the wrong methodology, yes, he is. 
But if we use the right methodology, no, we could not be speaking about all Jews and all Christians. Why? Because later on in the same surah he says, that in time to come you will find, listen carefully, you will find those who have the greatest love and affection for you Muslims will be those who say we are Nasara Christians. Which Christians? Are they all the same? Oh no, they're not. <laughs> there is that Christianity which is located in the Quran and is called Rum. Rum. There's a whole surah of the Quran named Surah to Rum. And in that surah Allah speaks about Rum. Ghulibatil Rum. Fi adnal That Rum was defeated in a land close by. But afterwards, not long afterwards, Rome is going to be victorious. Who is Rome? Rome is Christianity. But that Christianity, the old one, the one which was in Constantinople, the one which is in Russia today, the one which is in Bulgaria and Greece and Armenia, that Christianity, which is called Orthodox Christianity, this one broke away and went to Italy and went to Britain and went to the United States. And this is the Western Christianity. So they're not all the same. Allah is saying, do not take such Jews and such Christians as your friends and allies. Who? Who are? who themselves are friends and allies of each other. Are they Orthodox Christians in Greece and Armenia and Russia? Are they friends of the Jews? Have they made an alliance with the Jews? No, they have not. Well then, has this alliance come into being? Yes, it has. It is this Christianity the one in Washington, the one in London, the one in Rome, the one in Paris. This Western Christianity. These are the ones who have made an alliance with the Jews. And uh, it is a Zionist alliance. A Judeo-Christian Zionist alliance. Imran Hussein is speaking facts in this lecture. And the Quran prohibits us from maintaining friendly ties with such Jews and such Christians. They are the ones who have caused Jerusalem to recent the stage. They are the ones who defeated the Ottoman Empire and conquered Jerusalem. They are the ones who brought the Jews back to the Holy Land. They are the ones who created the state of Israel. And they are the ones who have protected Israel and strengthened Israel to the extent that Israel is now poised to take over from the United States as the next ruling state in the world. And so the first part of the hadith, Umran Ubayt al Maqdis, when Jerusalem is flourishing, who did it? They did it. The Judeo Christian alliance. Then the second part of the Hadith, Kharabu Yatrib. At that time, Medina would be in a state of forlorn desolation. Who is responsible for that? These are facts. Who is responsible for the status that Medina has today? Nabi Muhammad Islam is in Medina. And he praises Sham, Syria. And he praises Yemen. Allahumma barik lana fi shamina wa yemanina. And the people ask him, O Messenger of Allah, what about Najd? Arabia is divided into two parts. Hijaz, where you have Makkah and Medina. 
and the other part is nuts, where you have all the oil, for example. When they asked him about nudge, he said about nudge, from there will come earthquakes and tribulations, and from there you have karun no shaitan. Karun can mean horn, the horn of Satan. Karun can mean the age of Satan. The present rulers of Arabia who created the state of Saudi Arabia, named after a man named Saud. <laughs> so this present regime, they are from Najd. And they are in alliance with the Judeo-Christian alliance, the Zionist alliance. And they are the ones responsible for Medina today being in a state of forlorn desolation. And so now we know that when the Malhama comes, the Great War, it will have something to do with Israel wanting to rule the world. In order for Britain to become the ruling state in the world, Britain had to rule great war, wage great wars around the world. British troops were all over the place. British troops were in India. And then when the United States had to take over the ruling state of the world, you had two world wars, the first and the second. So in order for Israel to take over from the United States, you're going to have a really big, 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 big war. That's where we are now. The conquest of Constantinople will come after the Malhama. We'll come to that in a moment. How can we conquer Constantinople when it's already a Muslim city? Well, Con Constantinople was conquered in the year 1452, I think, by the Ottomans, Sultan Muhammad Fatih. And they ruled over Constantinople, that was where the Khilafah was, for 450 years. Until the modern Republic of Turkey took over from the Ottoman Empire. Hmm? And the Khilafah was abolished. But Constantinople, today called Istanbul, is still a Muslim city. So the Turks say that this prophecy about the conquest of Constantinople already took place in 1452. Nabi Muhammad al-Islam praised that army. He said, لَدَفْتَحَنَّ الْقُنْسْتَانْتِنِيَ You will most certainly conquer Constantinople. وَلَنِعْمَ الْأَمِيرُ أَمِيرُهَا وَلَنِعْمَ الْجَيْشُ ذَلِكَ الْجَيْشُ He praised the army and he praised the commander. So the Turkish Muslims took us for a ride <laughs> by telling us that the commander who was praised by the Prophet is Muhammad Fatih. And that army which conquered Constantinople, that's the one that the Prophet praised. And that conquest of Constantinople has already occurred. Already. But the Malhama has not yet occurred. <laughs> and the conquest of Constantinople comes after the Malhama. Hmm? No, no, no. The conquest of Constantinople will come. And it will come because Constantinople is controlled by NATO, which is the military arm of the Judeo-Christian Zionist Alliance. They control Constantinople. And that control over Constantinople is so important for them, military significance. Why? Because there is a narrow strait of water called the Bosphorus. The Bosphorus. And the Russian fleet, Navy, cannot come into the Mediterranean Sea except through the Bosphorus. So if you control the Bosphorus, you control Constantinople, Russian Navy cannot enter the Mediterranean. So when the Muslim army conquers Constantinople tomorrow, it will break the back of NATO and liberate Constantinople. 
And the military significance of that would be that the Russian Navy can now enter into the Mediterranean. In order for that conquest of Constantinople to take place, the Prophet Islam said something else. Remember, that alliance is prohibited for us, the Judeo-Christian Zionist alliance. Whosoever from amongst you turn to them with friendship and alliance, the Judeo-Christian Zionist alliance, which is today ruling the world, whichever of you, whoever of you Muslims turn to them with friendship and alliance, Allah says, you now belong to them, you no longer belong to us. In the law, I had to come with the enemy. So that's prohibited. But over here, with Rome, he said, you will make an alliance with Rome. Nobody knows about the subject. Nobody teaches the subject. Where are the teachers? That you will make an alliance with Rome. So now we are being told, Rome is Washington <laughs> because all the Sunni governments are all in Washington's pocket and only the Shia are friends and allies of Russia so therefore Rome has to be Washington that is schoolboy scholarship Rome is orthodox Christianity and the leader of the Orthodox Christian world today is Russia. It is only after the conquest of Constantinople take place in consequence of an alliance between Muslims and Rome, only then that the Dajjal will emerge, the Kuruj of the Dajjal. There is much that we can speak on the subject of the Dajjal, but time does not permit it today. We now want to turn to some of the micro-analysis of Akhirul Zaman. A defining moment in modern history occurred on the 9th, uh, the 11th of September, 2001. They call it 9-11. I was in New York that morning. Yeah. I went to Kennedy Airport myself that morning about 7 o'clock to pick up someone coming from Pakistan. And then I had to take that person to LaGuardia Airport. And when we reached LaGuardia, airport closed. Why? We don't know. And while we were sitting in the airport, Wondering why the airport closed. Then the announcement is made, everybody must vacate the airport. What's going on? Hmm? And then I heard somebody with a cell phone. I, I resisted using a cell phone for a long, long time. You know. So I heard this fellow say, one tower is done. One tower is done. something to do with World Trade Towers. So we got out of the airport, we drove back home while we were living in Queens, turned on the television, and there it was. <laughs> the 9-11 attack on the United States of America. As I saw it unveiling itself on the screen, I knew who did it. Oh yes, this was the Anglo-American Zionist Alliance. CIA and the Mossad. They are the ones who did it. In, and then put the blame on us. Most Americans today know that the government is telling a lie. Most Americans know that. And yet, the scholars of Islam will not, will not open their mouths and say that 9 11 was a lie. Not the scholars of Islam. You will hear everything else, but you will not hear this. Prophet Muhammad Islam said about Akhir al-Zaman, he said there will be great liars. So beware. There will be great liars. 
So beware. Should this not be on the member? Should it not be told in the, in the khutbah? Warning our people about great lies in after the Why did they do 9-11? I'll tell you why. Because the Prophet said about that child that when he is released, he'll live on earth for 40 days. Yawmun Kasana, one day which would be like a year, which is a long period of time, one the first stage. One day which would be like a month, which is a shorter period of time, stage two. One day which would be like a week, a short period of time, stage three. Wasa'iru ayyamihi ka'ayyamikum. And then finally at the end of his life, all his days will be like your days, meaning he'll be in our world of space and time, so you'll see him as a human being. But when he's released, he's going to be on an island. An island. We don't have time today to give all the arguments and evidence how I came to the conclusion. But in my book, Jerusalem and the Quran, I gave it. The island is Britain. And so from Britain he began, he launched his effort to rule the world eventually from Jerusalem. Britain became the ruling state in the world. Now right here in Trinidad, when we were children, we had to learn one pound four eighty, two pound nine sixty, three pound fourteen forty, four pound nineteen twenty. You're too young to know that, eh? Yeah? See you laughing? This is what we learned at school because the British sterling pound was the universal currency. We had to sing God Save the Queen. Oh well, no, sorry, God Save the King was George. God Save the King. Long live the King. Huh? That nonsense we had to sing. And if you'll excuse me, today we also have to sing some nonsense. A Muslim only pledges his life to Allah. A Muslim doesn't pledge his life to a mango tree. A Muslim doesn't pledge his life to a piece of hut or two islands in the Caribbean Sea. This is our native land. We pledge our lives to be. Not me. Who wants to do it to do it? Not me. I pledge my life to Allah. Not to any land, island in the Caribbean. So this was the time we had when Britain became the ruling state of the world. And then came a defining moment when Britain had to cede control to the United States. And the British rule over the world had to be demolished. <laughs> and that came after the First World War and the Second World War. And we know the exact moment in the Bretton Woods Conference when the sterling pound was demolished in the Bretton Woods Conference and the US dollar took over from the sterling pound. Britain is no longer the ruling state of the world. The final nail in the coffin is there, 1944. So we came to the conclusion when we wrote Jerusalem in the Quran that we are now located at that moment in time when a day which is like a month, Pax Britannica was for a long time, a day like a year. Pax Americana was for a shorter period of time, the US dollar ruling, a day like a month. But we are now located at that moment in time of transition. When a day like a month is to end and a day like a week is to commence, and Israel is to take over from the United States as the ruling state of the world. And so 15 years ago or more, on the basis of our study of the Quran and of the Hadith, we said the US dollar has to collapse, must collapse. We didn't do it on the basis of our study of international monetary economics. Because we studied monetary economics. But we did it on the basis of our study of the Quran and the Hadith. Nobody else was saying it. Fifteen years ago, 
that the US dollar must collapse and the US economy must collapse and a new monetary system must come to replace it so that Israel can rule the world. The paper money must disappear. This bogus and fraudulent and utterly haram paper money that we are using today must disappear. Uh, the only way you can say the paper money is haram. You, you wouldn't get this information if you study in Darul No, because the subject is not taught in the Darul But you're using paper money. Is paper money in the Quran? No, it's not. Is it in the Sunnah? No, it's not. Well, then how come you say it's haram? Haram. The only way you can form a judgment on paper money is if you study international monetary economics. Only then. And then you apply the Sharia to it. Then you can say, as I say, that it is haram. That's why they don't want me to lecture anyway. <laughs> they close all the doors of the masjid to me. It is utterly haram. When the paper money disappears, which is tomorrow, then what's going to replace it? Electronic money. Governments will no longer control money. Now bankers will control it. Bankers will rule the world. And who controls the banking system? Yeah, the Zionist Jews and Christians on behalf of Israel. And so Israel is on its way to take control of money. When that US dollar collapses, that's the time when you know that Pax America has ended, in Pax Judaica is now commencing. 9-11 was crafted for a number of reasons. One of which was, in order for the great wars to be waged, for Israel to replace the United States, Muslims must not have any weapon with which they can respond to threaten Israel. And one Muslim country has such weapons. Which one? Pakistan. Pakistan has nuclear weapons. And so they had to say it was Osama bin Laden hiding in a cave in Afghanistan who caused the US Air Force to remain on the ground. You know that Nazi story. Hmm? So that they could send American troops into Afghanistan. They didn't go to Afghanistan because of Afghanistan. No. They went to Afghanistan because the target is Pakistan. To destroy Pakistan's nuclear weapons and nuclear plants and to denuclearize Pakistan. And that attack is still to come. When will it happen? I am surprised it has not happened as yet. The closest they came to it was when they said they attacked some building in Abdapad and they got Osama bin Laden and they killed him. And then they said they threw his body in the sea. And then they said a big fish came and swallowed the body. <laughs> so sorry we can't provide the evidence. A big fish swallowed. Like you know, what, what is the name of that prophet? Jonah? A big fish came and swallowed. This is CIA. They like to make up stories. Eh? When they did that attack on Abdabad and said they had come, come, they had killed Osama bin Laden, Pakistan knew this was it. They're now going to attack Pakistan. So the Pakistani Prime Minister flew immediately to Beijing. And the Pakistani president flew immediately to Moscow. Forget Washington now. All the years that shining Washington shoes were now they fly to Beijing and to Moscow. The Chinese responded in a way that China never responded before in history. And it stunned them, the Western world. Stunned them. Like Putin just stunned them a few days ago. When Putin said, if you attack Syria, we will attack Saudi Arabia. 
they didn't expect that. So China said an attack on Pakistan will be an attack on China. And that's why the attack on Pakistan has not yet taken place. But it's going to happen. Because they cannot allow Muslims to have a weapon with which they can credibly threaten with Israel. Not only did 9-11 occur in order to target Pakistan, but also to target the Arabs. After 9-11 occurred, it was war on terrorism. War on terror. Guess who were the people who suffered the most from the war on terror? The Arabs. The Arabs. Arabs couldn't go on holiday anymore to the United States. The Arabs couldn't go anymore to holiday in Paris and in Geneva and so on. Once you're an Arab, you're a terrorist now. And the media is demonizing Arabs and Islam constantly because Osama bin Laden is an Arab, Al-Qaeda is Arabs and so on. And the governments which are supporting the Western world is terrorizing the Arabs. In Egypt, you couldn't have a bed. And this went on and went on and went on, inflicting, inflicting, inflicting more and more injury on the Arabs, getting them more and more riled up, more and more angry, with pent up rage until they exploded, as it was designed to explode. In what is known as the Arab Spring. It's by design, the Arab Spring. Why? did they want the Arab Spring? They wanted the Arab Spring so that Islamic parties could now take over as governments. And when Islamic parties take over as governments in the Arab world, and these Islamic parties now supporting the Palestinian brothers, particularly in Egypt, Israel can say terrorism. Israel can say that we are now being threatened. Islam is menacing Israel, and Islam is a menace to the world. And so you have what is known as causes bellum. So Israel can wage a big war to save mankind. That was the strategy. So the Arab Spring came, and then the Juan al Muslim woman the Egyptian Islamic party took the Sunnah of Nabi Muhammad and put it in a place called cold storage. Yeah? This famous Islamic movement, 60, 70 years old, suffered so much at the hands of Jamal al Nasir and Mubarak for so long. They took the Sunnah and they put it into cold storage. They took the Quran and put it into cold storage. And they took the Islamic movement, registered it as a political party. And fought the elections under a secular constitution. It was a secular constitution. In the Quran, Allah says that he is al Malik. He is the sovereign. Sovereignty belongs to him. The secular constitution says rubbish. That's wrong. You are not sovereign. The state is now sovereign. That's a secular constitution. That is shit. And when you go and vote in the elections, you now join the ship. But nobody will tell you that. No doubt or law will tell you that. That's why the door of the masjid is closed to me. This is not the Sunnah. The Quran and the Sunnah gave us the Khilafah state. The Khilafah state recognized Allah and so on. And when you go and accept this constitution and you vote in these elections, you now become a part of that ship. And you abandon the Quran and you abandon it. So this is what the Quran did. And uh, they became president, government. When the Khan became the government of Egypt, 
through this method, which is in violation of the Quran and Sunnah. They didn't draw the constitution to the country. Nabi Muhammad Islam also gave a constitution to Marina. It's called the Mitha. But he did it over patient negotiations over a period of seven months. And he used the constitution to unite the people. Jewish tribes which were in conflict with each other. Arab pagan tribes were in conflict with each other. And he united them all. The constitutional, constitutional sunnah is that the constitution is used to unite the people. If one used the constitution to divide Egypt, but Egypt has never been divided before. If one is making mistake after mistake. When they did that last December, I made it. I gave a lecture in Malaysia and I said, Ikhwan is now taking Egypt to civil war. That was eight months ago I said it. Civil war. And when all of Egypt came out on the streets demonstrating against the Ikhwan, the armed forces got an opportunity for revenge. Yes. And they took it. And they deposed Gursi and they took over the country. Because they want to take the country from them. They had been ruling all the time. But then something strange happened. And this is the new analysis that comes tonight in this lecture that my students around the world will be looking forward to. Something strange happened. When the Egyptian armed forces deposed Mursi, the coup d'etat. And we thought that maybe the Zionists I've lost one here because they wanted these Islamic governments. The United States, Britain and Europe are all very angry with the armed forces. They say, no, this is not democracy. Morsi must be released. He's, he's on the house of house arrest, I think. He came. And the government must be restored, says Washington and London and Paris. And But the Egyptian armed forces is not listening to them. No. Then Washington said, we're going to cut off the aid. Because Washington has been giving Egypt a lot of aid. As a result of which the Egyptian economy is surviving. With all that aid is gone. When Washington said, we're going to give up the aid, give up, give up your aid. Take away the aid that we're giving you unless you can restore the Ikhwan. Guess what Saudi Arabia did? For the last 70 years or 80 years of Saudi Arabia has been in existence. Saudi Arabia has been a very meek follower, camp follower of Uncle Sam. Like the American Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Never stepping out of line. Always following Uncle Sam. Ikhwan and, and Saudi Arabia were very friendly with each other for many, many years. And when Ikhwan took power in Egypt, the Saudis were bankrolling Ikhwan, providing them with funds, providing them with support. And Ikhwan turned to Saudi Arabia for religious inspiration. Saudi Arabia now does something strange. They immediately, the Egyptian armed forces took over the country. The Saudis dumped Ikhwan. The Saudis say they are terrorists, parroting the official law, these are terrorists. And the Saudis respond with support for the Egyptian armed forces. And then with a slap on the face of Washington, that is still stinging Washington, the Saudi says, if you take away the aid, we will give that back to you and give you more. The Arabs will give you more than the Washington will take away from you. This is not characteristic Saudi behavior. So we have a duty as analysts, as scholars of Islam, 
trying to explain the reality of the world today to the Muslim world, to the Muslim masses, we have a duty to explain why is Saudi Arabia behaving like this. The answer is, the Saudi is new, that we are now on the doorstep of great wars. The Saudi is new that the attack on Syria is coming. In fact, I thought it was going to come yesterday. <laughs> it didn't come yesterday. Because what Putin said, if you attack Syria, we will attack Saudi Arabia. That's why it didn't come yesterday. The Saudis were part and parcel of the advance planning. That the attack on Syria is coming. A NATO attack on Syria. And the Saudis did not want that when that attack takes place, that the Egyptian armed forces should come to the support of Syria. So Saudi Arabia, I hope the Egyptians are listening to me. Saudi Arabia has been trying to buy you. Is Egypt up for sale? I hope you heard my question. Is Egypt up for sale? Can the Saudis buy you? I don't think that Egypt is up for sale. And I don't think that the Egyptian armed forces will turn a deaf ear to the Egyptian people. When the attack on Syria takes place and the Egyptian people say no, we will come to the support of our Syrian brothers. That is why Saudi Arabia dumped Iqbal and came to the support of the Egyptian armed forces and made all these promises because Saudi Arabia wanted to take out an insurance policy to ensure that the Egyptian armed forces will not enter the war on the side of Syria. But there's a second reason as well. But we don't have the time tonight. We don't have the time to give you the second reason. It's going to take too much time. It concerns monetary economics. The Saudis have the United States in the palm of their hand like this. They can pull the plug on the US dollar any time they want. You will have to believe me because I don't have the time to explain it to you. It will take me about 15, 20 minutes to do that. I'll have to go to the hadith of the Prophet about the river Euphrates and a mountain of gold. I'll have to take you to the petrodollar. I'll have to take you to Bretton Woods. I'll have to take you to the International Monetary Fund. I'll have to take you to the Arab Israeli War of 1973. I don't have the time to do that tonight. So you believe me, Saudi Arabia has the United States in the palm of their hands here. The US dollar can be pulled on any time the Saudi wants. All that they have to do is to say you can buy our oil with any currency. That's all. You want to buy my oil with British pounds? You can do it. You want to buy the oil with US dollars? You can do it. You want to buy the oil with French francs? You can do it. With any currency. At this time, the law is that you must buy with USD. And that is what is keeping the US dollars, USD alive. <laughs> because Saudi Arabia slapped the United States and slapped the Western world so powerfully with that statement to the Egyptian armed forces. They've sent a message. I don't like to use this word, but it has to be used. This is blackmail. If the US dollar collapses, the US economy will collapse. And there will be riots in the United States, and Obama knows that. People are going to be killed in the United States. There will be civil war in the United States if the US dollar collapses. And the Saudis can cause it to collapse anytime they want. So this is called blackmail. Saudi Arabia is acting on behalf of Israel. Saudi Arabia is Israel's most strategic ally at this time. This will astonish our people who don't know the facts of what's happening in the world. The stage is now set for the United States <laughs> to begin dancing 
to the Saudi drum beats. Otherwise, the US dollar will be destroyed. How long will this last? Will patriotic Americans stand up and say no? If we have to turn to another currency, let's do it. But we're not going to be held hostage by those who want to threaten the US dollar. We have turned to Pakistan, we've turned to Egypt, and now let's turn to Syria, and we'll end. The reason why they had the Arab Spring was so that they could use the cover of the Arab Spring to take Libya. They had planned it long in advance, and you had stupid, foolish, absolutely foolish Muslims saying they're waging a jihad, taking weapons from NATO, taking money from NATO and from Saudi Arabia to launch what they call a jihad in Libya to overthrow the government. And today these fools have lost their Islam because of the Quran. You join them, you belong to them, you don't belong to them. When I said that to them about a year and a half ago, they were very angry with me. When I quoted the Quran and explained it to them, then some of them realized their mistake. What can we do now? It's too late. NATO is in Libya because Egypt has to be attacked. Egypt has to be attacked because Israel has to expand its territory to the biblical frontiers of the Holy Land. Otherwise, they won't accept the job. Israel has to be attacked by land, not only air and sea, to take the eastern delta. When that attack takes place, Israel will attack from the east and NATO will attack from the west. And Israel is sanctioned because of those fools who acted as Dajjal's warriors waging a Yankee Jihad in Libya. The Arab Spring came so it could be used as a cover for Syria. Why do they want Syria? Because Syria is the front line state. Syria has a border with Israel. Egypt has a border with Israel. But Syria's border is more strategic than Egypt's than Egypt border with Israel. They want Syria because they want to overthrow Assad so that they can install a Salafi government, Salafi Islam. And then they can show the whole world Salafi Islam wants to cut our throats. So they can have cause of development. They can wage war. So Islam is a menace to the world. But they've not been able to overthrow the Syrian government. Why? In Libya, they got the UN Security Council to have a vote to permit a no-fly zone. And then they had their NATO aircraft coming in and destroy the Libyan armed forces from the air. They couldn't get it in Syria because China and Russia vetoed it. And so it's only on the ground. And for two years now they've not been able to overthrow the Syrian government. The Jazz warriors have been fighting in Syria in a Yankee Jihad, killing and killing and killing and killing, but have not succeeded in overthrowing the Syrian. There's a second reason why they want Syria to be overthrown. Not only to install an Islamic government in, Egypt, in Syria, but because Syria is an ally of Russia. And Russia has a naval base in Syria. And if they can throw that naval base out of Syria and put a NATO naval base, it would be an embarrassment of the highest order for Russia. So now we see the stage is set. People who are warning me, sending me all kinds of news that Russia is a Zionist state and Putin is a Zionist state and all that rubbish. I hope they're listening to this lecture because now the evidence is clear that Russia is standing up to the Zionists. You can't come with that nonsense anymore. Russia and China have stopped every single resolution they tried in the Security Council. 
And now, when they're ready to attack Syria, using this bogus false flag chemical attack that killed over a thousand people, Putin a few days ago responded that if you attack Syria, if there's a need to attack on Syria, Russia will attack Saudi Arabia. Why are they so worried about a Russian attack on Saudi Arabia? What is there in Saudi Arabia? Not Makkah and Medina. No. It's the oil. A Russian attack on Saudi Arabia would destroy Saudi Arabia's capacity to pump oil. Because once you have a few oil wells in, engulfed in flames, they've got to shut down. Otherwise it'll spread and the whole thing will blow up. <laughs> That's oil. And if you shut down the oil of the Gulf, because it's not only Saudi Arabia, they attack Qatar as well. You will hear that. The whole Western economy will collapse if you can't get oil out of the Gulf. So Putin has checkmated them with that declaration. If you attack Syria, we will attack Saudi Arabia. Will they attack Syria? My answer, yes, they will. Why? Because these people, are, they have a pig-headed obsession. Pig-headed obsession. Give me another minute or two, we'll end. It is a pig-headed obsession. It doesn't matter to them if there is going to be a nuclear war. It doesn't matter to them if most of mankind is to die. It doesn't matter to them. Israel must rule the world. It's a pig-headed obsession. And that's where we are today. And had it not been for Russia and for Putin, we would already have had the Malachi. But the Malahama is coming soon. The alliance with Russia, therefore, is coming soon. On my way coming to Trinidad on this trip, I stopped in Russia for the first time and gave a lecture at the State University of Moscow in Russia. And I've been a graduate of a Darul Ulum. I don't think the Darul Ulum, this is not a bad talk in Darul Ulum. I'm not bad talking in Darul No, I am not back talking to them. The Darul Ulum's education, the syllabus of education, the curriculum, the books you are studying, the subjects you are studying, is inadequate to prepare a scholar to be able to respond to the challenges of the modern age. So this is not to bad talk. This is to say you need to change that syllabus, change that curriculum, change that methodology for the acquisition of knowledge in order to produce that Islamic scholarship that could go to the State University of Moscow, which is the most, the highest ranking university in the whole of Russia. And I got a friendly reception. I got a friendly reception. On my right hand side was Alexander Dugin, who is one of Russia's premier intellectuals, and he was the chairman of the program. And on my left hand side was Russia's, one of Russia's most eminent scholars of Christian eschatology. And I got a friendly reception, a respectful reception from Russia. And they were very happy with comments that I made. That when Sultan Muhammad Fatih conquered Constantinople in 1452. He took the greatest cathedral of Rome, Hagia Sophia, which had been functioning as a cathedral for 1,000 years in Constantinople, and shamefully and disgracefully and manifestly, sinfully, he transformed it into a masjid plunging a dagger into the heart of Rome so that the, the alliance between Muslims and Rome should never take place. That's what the Ottomans did. And it remained a masjid for 450 years until Mustafa Kemal took over and then he, he converted it into a museum. <laughs> 
So I said to them in Russia, when we conquer Constantinople, inshallah, the first thing that we will do is to return this cathedral to the Christians. This is yours. The second thing we will do is to apologize to you for what was done. And the third thing that we will do is to restore the name of the city to Constantinople. Because that's the name our prophet used. On my way back, inshallah, I will again be passing through Moscow. And this time I hope I can meet with the Russian Orthodox Church to begin discussion with them to try to come closer together so that the alliance with Rome prophesied by Nabi Muhammad might come to pass. ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم برحمة الله الرحمن الرحيم آمين